Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast. If you're not already, we would really appreciate it. If you guys went and reviewed us on Apple or Spotify, those reviews really help people find the podcast and help it get recognized. And, uh, you know, if you've been enjoying the show, we really appreciate your support. Another thing that you can do to support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the, the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eyes On. Today, we have a special treat aside from our usual lineup star host cast with both Dee and Jason. Today, we have Mark Polymeropoulos. And I am smiling a little bit because we were laying bets on who would uh, mess up his name the most, but because it is firmly being ingrained uh, into my memory, it, it trips off my tongue. I'm delighted to have him. You will be pleased to hear uh, <laughs> that that we are going to give him stream of consciousness today. Um, quick, a bit, quick bit about Mark in case you've been hiding under a rock and uh, just uh, don't know who he is. Um, Mark spent 26 years in the agency, uh, has had a number of, uh, a, when you look at his his resume, it's um, a lot of hard billets in bad places. Um, and, and yes, you know, the, uh, Jason will tell you, of course, that's the norm for the agency. But it looks like Mark has actually chosen these places out. Um, Mark, has, Mark also um, was the uh, target of, uh, uh, I think we're suspecting, or well, he is suspected it was an, e an EW attack or a directed energy attack uh, that... that um, uh, resulted in in um, traumatic brain injury, um, and he's he's been going through treatment for that. Um, so, if you have questions about, please you know do uh, do ping him. And uh, since you know since leaving the agency, and by the way, you know Mark uh, Mark's name carries a lot of wasta in the agency. Uh, when we even thought we were getting him on the show, Jason, I I don't know how to say it other than what I mean, he was giddy uh, and girl. Oh, yeah. was right. the name. But anyway, since <laughs> my point is, since Mark's got out, he has continued to do great work for the course. Some of you may have been following his writing and his commentary. He is one of those rare people who they rope in as an expert uh, to Fox News, uh, MNSBC, yeah. NBC. Well, anyway, several MSNBC. networks. Yeah. Hey, thank you. The spanning the net. Okay, that's long enough intro, Mark. We are delighted to uh, to have you on, and uh, I'm going to turn over to you to uh, to talk about your your favorite topic, which I think is soft uh, agency integration. So, so hey, thanks guys so much. Um, you know, it's it's an honor to be on here. Congratulations on the show. I actually, I'm I have I have listened to it. I have watched it. Um, love it. Uh, and of course, I've been a friend of the team house um, for, for some time. I think, D, how many times I've been on? Five times? Uh, I don't I think know. If it's I think it might be four. Okay. Uh, but it's been it's been a blast. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, because again, I, I love coming on because I'm talking to my old peeps. Um, and there's a sense for me of comfort, frankly, in doing that is, you know, when we, lo when we leave the agency, you know, there's a lot of things I don't miss about it, but there's certainly the camaraderie and kind of the brotherhood and sisterhood. That's what I really really do miss. And so thanks for having me on. Great honor. I know it's early in the morning, but come on, I'm almost 55 years old. I, I get up at like five. So you guys got to suck it up. <laughs> it's not early. It's 730. There you go. This generation. <laughs> we got Generation Z and, and uh, it's very early for me. I'm Jason a looks young uh, like enough it. to be Generation X, but he's not. I have, I have grandkids. This is early. <laughs> wow. there you go. Yeah. So no, but you, 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 you mentioned something. Um, I just did a a talk to a DOD seminar, a Department of Defense seminar. I think there was 1,400 people on a Zoom call, and it was something that I actually believe in passionately. And that's, you know, we're, the future of the CIA Special Operations, you know, forces, SOF uh, uh, relationship. Um, but really how we do this kind of in the era of great power competition, which is kind of Russia, China, in some case, you know, maybe Iran, but, you know, almost kind of the, the crappy states um, or, or where the Department of Defense sees kind of our greatest threats coming from. But how do we take those 20 years of the GWAT in which the US, which the CIA and SOF 
were kind of, you know, uh, aligned side by side. How do you translate that? And in particular, and I know I'm, I'm jumping into the weeds too much. You guys will shut me up. D, start waving your hands if I'm talking too much. Um, but but how do you do this in the era of what we call, and Jason's going to know this really well, ubiquitous technical surveillance, which means a way different operational environment that I grew up in, that Jason operated in, um, and that, you know, how does the agency and, and SOF um, uh, run, you know, in essence, clandestine slash covert operations um, when you have sensors everywhere? Um, really interesting stuff. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's my that's my stream of consciousness this morning, Aside, along with, you know, I was I, you know, picked up, I was reading the paper this morning. I was thinking about our colleagues, at the U.S. Embassy in, in Port-au-Prince and Haiti. I mean, holy shit. Talk about environments in which we all used to operate. That is crazy, crazy stuff going on now. So that's where I am this morning. Jacked up on coffee and I've been up a, a while. So, hey, Mark, on the on this, um, your, your discussions of, of soft agency, can you can you just talk about I mean, I'm. I'm all on when we look at our past experiences. When I was hosting the Irregular Warfare podcast, we had a, a, some really good uh, episodes on this particular topic. And um, when we look back, yes, we eventually figured it out. Actually, in Afghanistan, right off the bat, but then, um, but then we had some rocky times in that relationship. And sometimes when it was too compartmentalized, it always worked really well at the team level you know yep. always always never and so if we can capture that um if you could maybe talk about some so i mean areas of times before what uh colombia i'm thinking of like uh things like plan colombia where or el salvador where small you know soft and and the agency worked together very well on an informal level and the second thing um if you could just talk about in a, in you, you can do this in a way that that makes a otherwise dry subject sound really exciting, but the you know the the title ten, title fifty um, obstacles, perception thereof, sure. et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So I mean, let's let's go back to to World War II. You know, so the, the creation of the office, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. So kind of you know the, the intelligence gathering, special operations. You know, in in some sense. Um, uh, uh, always kind of had an entity, and that was the OSS. And in fact, the CIA and SOF were born out of the same kind of, you know, thing. Um, and so, you know, and, and but they are two different entities. As you, as you mentioned, Andy, they operate under different titles, whether, you know, Title 10 or Title 50, which is intelligence operations versus um, uh, military operations. But ultimately, I think that uh, if, if I look back on my career, I mean, I started the agency in 93. So really the Balkan conflict, in Bosnia, you know, is where this this stuff kind of started, um, and where you know members of my generation first got a got an inkling that we have to kind of integrate and, and work closely with with SOF. And then, of course, um, 9/11 uh, occurred. But the, what what kind of bound us together was necessity. And so and, and so and, and that, of course, is the challenge now. You know, so what do we have? We had war zone uh, operations. We had embassies in Baghdad and Kabul with a thousand personnel. That means there's a thousand CIA personnel who every day are side by side with their soft brothers and sisters. And so we kind of squished together, forced to kind of learn about each other. Everyone has their own habits. Everyone has their own preconceived notions. I mean, you know, what does it happen? So, you know, someone from fifth group walks in and we say, hey, here come the knuckle draggers. Some of the agency comes in, they say, watch your wallet. They're going to steal our shit. And that was the first, you know, that was the first kind of uh, uh, reaction. But then over time, because you had this um, uh, certainly a common enemy, but but we're actually in proximity next to each other. We were forced to adapt and learn. And I think that is absolutely key. But what does what does that really mean? It means personal relationships. And that's, you know, in the, in the kind of the talk that I gave, um, I called it the three R's. It was relationships, resources, and then Russia, meaning um, meaning kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, our conflicts uh, for the future, uh, being re really Russia, China. But but when I say relationships, so, you know, I talk think about Chris Miller, um, I, I don't know if he's on your show or not. Chris Miller was the you know acting Secretary of Defense in the Trump administration. I first met Chris on the border with with uh, uh, you know in Kuwait on the border with Iraq in 2002 when he was with Fifth Group. And so you know you have these personal relationships. Same thing with you know the uh, the he was he was I think he's now the Commander of JSOC. I don't even know if I'm supposed to uh, say his name. He was the head of SEAL Team Six of Dev Group. I first met him when he was just a you know a regular SEAL officer. And so because just side by side, year after year and where um, uh, in Afghanistan, um, in Iraq, in Syria, I'm going to think of, you know, good buddy of mine, Rob Lively, he, re he retired as the, the CSM, the command sergeant major of, he'll get mad if I say this, of Delta. 
Um, he doesn't say it, but I'll say it. Him and I spent six months together kind of in Syria years ago and got to be great friends. And so when they kind of, when, and when everyone grows up together in their organizations, those relationships are key. So, and Andy, when you, you know, I think about things that went wrong sometimes. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a strike in Yemen. It's the famous wedding strike. It was a bad, bad strike on AQAP, killed a lot of innocent people. Huge mess between the, the agency and, uh, and, and SOF and JSOC really. And it was worked out in the end because the personal relationships that I and a whole bunch of other people had. And so think about that in relationships, you know, born in the OSS kind of, I think Bosnia was a, was a big deal, but then um, Afghanistan, Iraq really kind of uh, made that and kind of nurtured it. Um, and so that, you know, as you, you guys know this, everyone knows this. I mean, I can, you know, if, if you and I know each other and something bad happens, but you know, we have this personal relationship, we're going to figure it out um uh as bad as it might be um and 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 you can kind of overcome all those biases one key point just to make on this stuff and, and i think it started in bosnia as well a, a play, you know colombia I, I imagine same thing i'm not just not as, as familiar but as a case officer and jason you'll understand this as a case officer so if i'm sitting in baghdad if i'm sitting in uh in, in kabul um I have, I have an agent meeting you know we have a penetration of isis or al-qaeda or something like that um, uh, and so, but our, our, our kind of, our kind of piece in this pie and the find and fix finish mission is the find and fix mission. And I got my soft colleagues to the right or left of me and not, you know, they're, they're doing the finish. Why would I not? And I did, and it was not the norm, but why would I not in the beginning of some of these conflicts, take a soft operator with me to an agent meeting? I mean, do I not fucking trust them? Of course I do. Uh, they're, they're an American. They have their clearances. Now that was not the norm. But I would take someone, for example, from Dev Group with me to an agent meeting when we're trying to go after a high value target. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, perhaps CIA headquarters would go bananas about this. But then slowly this gets kind of institutionalized. And we're like, you know what? Um, you know, these guys get it. We can trust them. And they're in fact, they're the consumer as we're doing these fine fix finish. My consumer is my soft colleagues right next to me. Yeah. Not the president of the United States. It's not the secretary of state. I'm not getting the talking points for the foreign minister. I'm getting a location uh, of, of, a, of a bad guy. And so, you know, that kind of uh, uh, understanding and that change in mindset, I think, was really important. Um, and, you know, what does it do? It builds trust uh, and uh, uh, and ultimately it's successful. And so, you know, some of my fondest memories, I mean, you know, a great buddy of mine is Mick Mulroy. You guys have had him on the show. I mean, Mick and I have been in Iraq and Afghanistan together. And and when we we're up on the Nile teams in northern Iraq, um, living with the Kurds, I mean, this is where, you know, and, and he think I, he, I think he wrote a piece, too. Um, that he got cleared by the agency about this too, the the kind of the integration with 10th group and how, how you know, the our agency kind of element there along with uh, uh, special operations forces really were critical in, in kind of um, in, in the battle against uh, not only Saddam's or, or Iraq, but also uh, terrorist groups. And so it's just a way to do it. And so the key thing on the relationships is, I guess the question is, how do we continue that now um, when we have Russia, China, mm. uh, when you don't have embassy Baghdad or embassy Kabul, how do those relationships um, we need to, we need to nurture them. We need to sustain them. I mean, I'm retired, you know, Jason, you're out. And so, so, you know, so at the end of the day, um, uh, we got to, we got to make sure that these relationships, uh, uh can flourish, uh, or we're going to go back to those old biases. Absolutely. I mean, I came in during a time when EO one, two, triple three, um, which basically told us you will cooperate, uh, but that was interagency, uh, was really hot and heavy. So, it, I didn't, you know, obviously. Can you, can you explain quickly what, what that was? The executive, executive order one, two, triple three. It's um, the, the, I don't know the legalese of it, but basically it's, it was after nine 11 when we saw the mistakes that had been, been made because of compartmentalization between us and mainly FBI. Uh, literally we sat or FBI sat in our spaces and, but didn't share the information. They would get information from their people, but literally within the same office wouldn't tell us not I say us as in CIA this is before me so 9-11 happens and we figure hey you know we can't have this so EO one two triple three was signed and disseminated saying you will cooperate uh with one another and so I came in at a time when it was already being implemented so I didn't have an issue of, hey, I can't tell you that, you know, um, yes, there were certain things that I need to be read into, or someone had to get permission from their um, ASAC or, you know, or their special agent in charge to be able to tell me, but it was pretty smooth. I had some, you know, speaking of what Mark was talking about, some great relationships with FBI agents that I still have, who are in some pretty senior positions today. But again, they were 
a special agent, junior special agent. I'm a junior intelligence officer. And, you know, we just, we just clicked on a personal level. And because of that, I did a lot of work domestically. So uh, when I would go out to these meetings, if that person, you know, it, uh, FBI, we would take FBI along with us and they would be able to ask questions from a legal standpoint, you know, trying to make a case or whatever they're trying to do that I might have been able to ask, but it might cross a line or it was something that I just didn't even think to ask because I'm not looking. I'm looking at gathering the intel. You know, they're looking at it from a uh, prosecution um, standpoint or a counterintelligence standpoint. So those relationships were pretty awesome. And sometimes in the beginning, it was, hey, let's sit down and um, and uh, game this. Let's figure out you ask this. I'll ask that, blah, blah, blah. After a while, it just became um, sympathetic. It was just, you know, they knew to ask questions that I missed or, you know, things like that. Or they would be able to even say something that would calm the person down because I'm getting them revved up trying to get the intel, they would be able to say something or I would be able to say something to calm that person down, reset, and then they would be more comfortable telling us what we need to know. So I think that's a smaller scale of what Mark is talking about. No, 100%. But and again, it's, uh, uh, it, but it's also based on necessity, you know? And so that's uh, that's huge. By the way, I think I flipped Title 10, Title 50 when I was, I was describing that. Sorry about that. Because um, if you think back, uh, uh, Title uh, uh, the Bin Laden operation was a Title 50 operation. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The, so so all of those were good things, but we have, and when I say we, I mean we collectively, U.S. security establishment have a dreadful record about, about holding on to lessons learned and reapplying yeah. them right off the mm -hmm. bat the next time we need to. And and as you point out, Mark, now is the time to do this. And, um, you, you know, while there are obstacles in the way, I mean, I it, can I just give you an example that I think, you know, sure. I think you're right on target. OK, so we are, you know, we've been talking about the Red Sea uh, problem recently. Bottom line is this. There's really only two ways to solve that. One is to really, really put pressure on Iran, but that might not even solve the problem. Who knows if the Houthis are now the teenagers ready to leave the house? Number two, and everyone cringes when I say this, but you do need to have someone on the ground. Because yeah. that terrain there, you can you can launch all the airstrikes you want based on targeting data that looks really good, and still not hit a damn thing that you know of worth and worth doing. You know how it is. It's very easy for them to move stuff. Um, it's very easy to do it um, undercover, et cetera, et cetera. So the only way you can get in, and obviously you don't want to put conventional forces there who are basically helmeted targets just walking around. You want to put guys who, who are working with Ian Ditch on the ground. Yeah. Who does that best, you know, um, agency, but you have to have uh, DOD reps there too, because of the support that you're going to need. Um, you know, you, you guys know, yes, of course, in principle, DOD will, or, I mean, DOD will always support, but it really helps, really helps if you have soft guys, you know, represent uh, on, on the ground too. Um, yeah, and you should. I mean, you know, it's so, so. But I mean, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we do that going ahead? You yeah. know, I mean, what? So I think there's okay. So there's there's a there's a, a couple things on that. If and if you take a look, for example, you know, Ukraine is in, is not great just because of the kind of the prohibition um, set by the White House on 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 no U.S. boots on the ground. So you know, ostensibly, you know, D will smile now. You know, there's a there's a rather large intelligence community footprint in Ukraine, um, and and what there should be is a soft footprint as well. There's not because of prohibition from the White House, but but really that would be an ideal. Um, you know, uh, and that's just something that, you know, you kind of have to uh, uh, ultimately live with. But, you know, when you think about kind of the I call it and it's not it, it's, so it's, it's the manhunting triad of human SIGINT um, and, and ISR, but it would apply to something like the Houthis as well. So, you know, you do need human. And so that means yeah. you need people on the ground. Um, and so so let me get let me go back to uh, what I was talking about before. And one of the one of the evolutionary things that happened with SOF is. Um, they also had the ability and were trained and they went down to our schoolhouse, down to the farm as well. So they had they had some, you know, the, 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 the special mission units um, of, of SOF uh, have in some ways some of the same training as the agency does in terms of, um, you know, surveillance detection, human, yeah. yeah. meetings, human. Um, there's there's I got to be careful in saying this. There's troops, there's there's units in these special mission units who are trained yep. up to kind of the gold standard. So there's a way to kind of work together um, with the agency on this. I, I kind of I, I agree completely, 100 uh, percent completely. Um, but but let me kind of flip all of this to 
what's important is how to sustain these relationships, how to sustain this ability to work together. And it has to do, I think, with, uh, with training. And so one of the things I, I, what I still don't understand doesn't happen is why, for example, for uh, uh, the special forces, the Q course, why for the agency, the you know, tradecraft training down at the farm, why are we not cross training? Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you take everyone, this is going to be a silly analogy, like, you know, out of the womb at birth, when you're training someone yep. uh, to be uh, uh, in our kind of old weird world, let's start from, the, let's start with the idea of we're going to have to work together from the beginning. So in the final problem set at, down the farm or in the Q course, integrate what a station would be like, yep. integrate yep. what an interagency Absolutely. environment is like, integrate what a war zone environment is like, do it from the beginning, because what happens? People learn, but then all of a sudden I'm sitting there. 26 years old, just graduated the farm next to my, you know, maybe someone a, a, of a similar age from uh, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, special operations. I'm going to know that person for the next 20 years because we train together. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't do that. I don't get that. Um, it's because, yeah. you know, and but it's going to take, you know, and, and of course, and Jason will remember this, that there's a, there'll be a thousand reasons we can't do this. Yep. Okay. Because they're not cleared or we're too busy or this or that. Mm -hmm. You should do it. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, talk about what we do even domestically with the Bureau, same thing. Um, why down at Quantico is there, you know, are there, when they're training to be a special agent, why are there not agency folks down there? This is what it was like to be, I got to be careful again, but in a, perhaps a domestic environment, mm. what a domestic station would look like. Here's how you um, work with your, your intelligence community partners, Mr. or Mrs. Special Agent. So it's, it's that you know, that kind of that training piece that I think we uh, we're not getting right. And we're going to fall back on our bad habits again. Um, and all of a sudden, when China moves on Taiwan and we have an embassy country team that's kind of in a panic on this um, in Taiwan, you know, and, and, and agency and soft and, the, you know, the bureau, there all together. Well, if you know, if, if they didn't experience Iraq and Afghanistan or Syria and they might not, um, how are they going to work together? Well, they would be able to if they trained. So that's yeah. my Mark, show. Mark, that's a that's a really interesting point. And and you brought up uh kind of a couple of things that, that I want to go back sure. and touch on. So first of all, uh your point about integration with training. Yeah, it it is it is amazing that we haven't done that yet at the institutions. You know, we all know that it's happening. For instance, in MARSOC, we would bring agency yep. guys into our former agency guys into our exercise, but it's still not quite the same as yep. you know having a met one gray beard there is different uh than than setting it up so you're actually integrating training and i i and and i think you know the, the obstacle to that is just the fact that although there is a a great um kind of peacetime i'll use that term peacetime i hate it but peacetime relationship or in between the wars relationship between the agency and tier one that relationship tends to atrophy yep. between the agency and I, you know, I, I hate using these terms, but uh, soft, right? Tier two or, you know, whatever we're calling them today, white soft, yeah. um, which is, you know, which is, which is all important. Which but is I think you're way on, larger, way larger. Yeah. 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 And, and the tentacles are farther and yep. it is, but, and, and it's really where you want to have that connection right. because it is where you're doing stuff day in, day out in an area with people who are regionally affiliated with that area. Um, last thing I'm going to say though, though on, on that, I think you're on the right track because putting people, you know, when we're talking about forcing this or not forcing it, but, you know, forming a task, organized teams, it's going to take forever. You know that yeah. we're not even within DOD, but now you're talking about between DOD and an outside agency. And you're talking about doctrine and you're talking about, you know, so many other things that it will take. We will talk about this forever before we do it. But if you set up within the schoolhouses and the institutions, then you're building that relationship informal and you've got type A personalities in on both sides who are going to make this happen in, in a and, and come up with really good ideas in each so region. Let me let me throw in. Here's a here's a great hypothetical scenario that I that I use all the time um, because I have to say it's hypothetical just to get it by the agency publication review board, but it's not hypothetical because it's true. That's the secret. To your <laughs> Is this going to be like uh, Jason's hypothetical honeypot? <laughs> yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, sorry. Never happened. So, so let's say, so uh, uh, again, a hypothetical. So you're at a uh, U.S. embassy um, in Eastern Europe and your role 
is, uh, you know, it, obviously it's, it's not the same as, as a war zone, but your role is to, uh, to kind of uncover, find out what Russian intelligence officers are doing, right? It's a small CIA station. Um, and so, and, and, you know, we're working with, with the, the local liaison too, but in essence we're doing, and just think about this compared to the, the GWAT, we need to find POL, pattern of life on the Russian IO presence, right? So what does that mean? A lot of time on the street, some kind of surveillance training, maybe, you know, you know recruiting folks uh, who, who can assist on this. Um, it's a fine fix mission, but the finish mission obviously is not, uh, you know, a Hellfire missile yeah. from an MQ-9. The finish mission is going to be a recruitment attempt. A finish mission might be a disruption operation with, with local liaison, but that's the, that's the job. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you have a soft element that kind of rolls in. Um, uh, and they're doing uh, primarily, uh, uh, again, it's in Eastern Europe. So they're probably primarily training, you know, local security services. So a station chief, a smart one, and this is where the, this is the resources piece of my whole argument is the, the smart one's going to be like, you know, Hey, you guys like, or gals or whoever it is like, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, I have a, I have a manpower shortage because CIA always does overseas. People forget how small like, there's less, there's more FBI special agents in New York city than there are CIA case officers globally. Yeah. So that's how small CIA is. But the locals, the station chief would say to the, the, the soft commander, who's probably not an officer, probably, a, you know, an E eight or nine or whatever. And, and so, so he would say, you know, what training do you guys have or gals have? And they're like, well, you know what, you know, we did the equivalent of kind of what we call HETSI, hostile environment trade course, the tradecraft course. In fact, there's, the, and, and, you know, and, and there's lots of units that, that have had HETSI training and they're like, and the, C, the COS is going to be like, all right. Hey, so when you're done with your training evolution with, mm -hmm. with the, the local security services, can I have some of your guys and gals to go out in the street? Cause I got to find these Russian Intel officers. We got to find their pattern of life and give me two weeks. Um, uh, and so the local SOF, uh, uh, team lead will be like, well, goes back to, you know, goes to his teammates. Hey, you want to help the agency out kind of chasing Russian assholes? And they're like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and so it's all right. So now what do we have now? So there's, there's some people have, have trained correctly. We have resource issues. Now, what happens, of course, is this is wildly successful um, uh, in the field. And back in the rear in SOF, the, the, the commanders, the officers hate it. Well, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be doing your training mission. Um, uh, but, but oh, and, and by the way, guess what's not? There's no zero dark 30 mm -hmm. moment. You know, so because so, what the agency will do is mm -hmm. thank you for this targeting study on the Russian IO presence. And guess what, SOF? You're never going to hear what happened. Yeah. In fact, if it's successful and we recruit a Russian, you know, 99% of CIA headquarters is not going to hear. It's going to get into a compartmented channel. And so all of a sudden, this kind of, you know, what we got addicted to, including me, very selfishly, the fine fix and finish portion, taking bad guys off the battlefield, you don't have that anymore. Um, and so that has to be a change in mindset of SOF as well. But that scenario works and can work yeah. really well. And I remember I retired in 2019. Yeah. I had these discussions with Sakir. Special Operations Command Europe, uh, uh, you know, senior leadership, and they were game at the time. I don't know what happened, but I was like, we need some I, help. And, and I can and tell you, I, do. I can tell you that happens. I can give you an example of a yeah. really, really savvy station chief in a country that, well, in the Middle East, yeah. uh, who who did exactly that integrated. Actually, there were Marsoc guys right. um, to to generate um, it, it. It was to to help the case officer to help collection efforts. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember, but I don't think we had to get a lot of clearance to do that. He was, you know, what because what he was having them do was already within the parameters Perfect. of what they were allowed to do. But he had enough rather than that usual kind of uh, there's always there's always courtesy. Uh, but but here there was there was real collaboration and it was based on his his initiative. I mean, there's gotta, always cultural the relationship. And then all of a sudden, like there's no, you know, credit is shared. Or, or, yeah, or the, exactly. The end result is, is it, unknown. Like we're going to leave, yeah, collectively, and maybe the CI station too. Like we're never going to know the fruits of our labor. If you're if you're sitting in the station there as well, and you leave that targeting study sitting there, if it's successful down the line, no one's going to from Russia House, our operational unit, super compartmented. No one's calling you and saying, "Hey, what you did a year ago." Yeah, worked. yeah. And so you have to have that mentality that there's you know there's a greater gain, greater you know, greater purpose here. And so and, and by the way, in in these guys, yeah. the Marines involved. In their yeah. careers as ASOTs and you know, yeah. or, or just regular, that is the that's the only time they got to do in a yeah. you know kind of a, a a totally non combat, not even near combat environment, third country, right. uh, doing that kind of type of operation. And Andy, let me tell you something: I've never met a soft operator who didn't want to do it. 
That's what yeah. I was going to say. Yeah, who yeah. wouldn't want to do it? Yeah, who wouldn't? Yeah. They, loved it. they loved it. They said, this is great. And you can, you know, yeah. and then you can be, you know, uh, I, I, you know, hitting the bars or watching Armed Forces Network on TV, you know, those stupid commercials that they yeah. still have. Um, uh, or you can go out and help, you know, you know, help Team America. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I never met anyone who didn't want to do it. it. But but again, is this institutional? No. And so, yeah. you know, it's and and I, you know, I in this in this paradigm I'm talking about, I actually, you know, I call I, I, I don't ever reach back into the I retired in 2019. I'm very careful. I don't know what they're doing now. I don't reach back to the agency. But I do talk to my buddies like Mick and others who have some experience with this and kind of all of us kind of collectively, you know, Doug Weiss as well. Another guy you should get on your show. Mm -hmm. uh, a great friend of mine, former deputy director, DIA and chief of station in Baghdad. Um, I think another team house veteran, too. Uh, but but, you know, so we, as we're talking about this kind of premise of CIA soft, you know, in, in, into the future, I think a lot of us do think these problems still exist. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they figured everything out in the last three or four years, but I, I don't think so. I I, I think culturally, it's hard to imagine that they have figured it out. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've talked here about, again, it's just um, when I was in Israel a couple of weeks ago, and and yes, despite all the uh, the dreadful failures that they have, have done, they have one thing very strongly on their side now, that is unity of purpose. Yep. And, and all the barriers, any barriers that were there before, to include between the services, uh, seem to have disappeared. I mean, it's... Um, but we, yeah, and that happened with us in the in the immediate aftermath of nine eleven. Right. Um, but but when we don't need to, we tend to lose that touch point and we revert to our own uh, our own areas. Biases, but yeah. what you what you described integration with case officers um, work because we use soft is used to working with agency paramilitary, not working with them. But that that's kind of their natural shaded area in the Venn diagram. But actually, they can do a, a, <laughs> arguably in these places, a lot more constructive uh, or, or a strategically relevant stuff for case officers or station yeah. chief. Yep. Yep. Free labor. Sorry. That's what yeah. I'm looking for. Yeah. And, you know, sure. Patriotic Americans, free labor, excited to go kind of take the fight to the, you know, it's where we are 2024 and, and beyond. That's, that's kind of Russia, China, Iran. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, and, and so I don't know. I mean, I, I hope this is done. One thing to note on this, though, and that's this is this will be my next kind of soapbox. You know, D, you gave me some okay to do stream of consciousness. <laughs> so sorry, you know me. Um, and that's what's we call the ubiquitous technical surveillance environment. And so, you know, the where we all kind of grew up um, uh, in terms of counterintelligence threats has changed dramatically. And and you know, and and so you know, what does that mean? And so, just kind of for the for the regular person, it's it's you know, it's your cell phone. Well, that's that's. An incredible kind of collection device for any hostile service. Um, it's it's biometrics. When you go into an airport, you get your picture taken. It's some place I would I would always laugh. Biometrics, how much how hard it is for us. Some of these systems are actually systems the agency gave to the host country. <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Just don't use this on us. I don't know if that was well thought out. Yeah. Right. Um, you already then, program then, program in all your all your bio data. Right. It's the same time. Cities. Smart cities are everywhere. There's the camera mm -hmm. systems, and so. The world now is a collection of sensors, um, and and so and so that is a that has a huge uh, effect on both the the CIA and the soft community because you can't hide anymore. Mm. And so you know the, the perfect example is you know in the past you know I, let's say I, I was I was in I don't know throughout a place Damascus Syria so I go off you know I I uh, I, I have my cell phone I turn it off um, leave it in my house uh, uh, do my surveillance detection route meet an agent successfully I know I'm black. There's no, you know, hundred percent sure I'm black, do a reverse surveillance detection route, come back, got some great gouge, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, something that the, the president, the national security advisor is going to love. Syria is a, was a hot button issue, uh, pour myself a little Jameson. And, you know, that was, that was a great day. That world doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Not at all. And so let me, and if you dissect that, and this is all, you know, this, all this, everything I'm telling you now has been cleared. It's okay for me to talk about by the agency. Um, so, so what does that mean? Well, first of all, your cell phone, if it's, if you turn it off, the hostile service is monitoring your cell phone all the time. That's a, you know, so that's a, that's a flag. Um, when you drive and you do your surveillance detection route, if you're running through things like such as smart cities or any kind of sensors, um, uh, you know, that can be, that's, that's data that can be not only seen real time, it can be recorded for the future. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, in all, so when you go back and you're sitting in your house saying, I was, I was surveillance free, I did a successful agent meeting that doesn't exist anymore. Um, cause we don't know. 
because this data is collected and it can be stored. And then that stored data, which means these sensors again, um, uh, everything from your cell phone usage to uh, the camera system of a city to your vehicle, which is a, just a rolling GPS, um, to any casuals on the street with a, with a smartphone, all of that you know, is, is stored forever, but then with AI it can be accessed immediately. So hostile services can kind of go back years and take a look at, at data on a certain individual. And so, you know, my argument in all this, and I think that, you know, the, and the HCIA did put together what's called the Ubiquitous Technical Surveillance Center. The, Bill Burns has announced this publicly. There's a UTS center. So it's, it's how do we do things? How do, do, how do we kind of uh, uh, tackle this really, uh, this enormous problem of sensors, which kind of control our lives? I mean, I sound like some crazy futurist, but I'm not. And the, the answer is probably to kind of go to do something called in-pattern operations. And, and you know, uh, Jason's nodding, but it's the notion of hiding in plain sight. So instead of doing a surveillance detection route, I'm going to go to, you know, uh, I'm going to go to Liverpool in England and go to a Liverpool game with 50, 60, 70,000 fans. And my agent meeting is going to be in that stadium somehow um, because I've established a pattern of going all the time to Liverpool games. And so is my penetration of the Chinese embassy. They're doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, everyone, you know, and, and so, it's, it's, you know, so ultimately you kind of build things in pattern. And the challenge is, first of all, how does the agency do this? But then here's the other thing. There's 70,000 members of SOF. How do you do that with 70,000 members who, by the way, everyone's addicted to what? You know, my fancy, you know, my fancy watch um, uh, or your phone. I'm, uh, my, your Fitbit. Mark, but I just jump in very quickly. Yes, sure. 70,000 for the baby. You know this. Everyone here knows this. 70,000 people in SOCOM. Yeah. But when you're talking about to the kind of the pointy end of the spear, actually, US soft is very tail exactly. heavy. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, but that's the scale. That's the challenge we have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah. Ultimately, so how do we run in pattern operations um, for CIA, but also CIA and soft together? Again, um, a, an enormous challenge. And, uh, and, you know, and, and so that's because, because the, the, the whole kind of our trade has changed so dramatically. Um, uh, and you know, it's, 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 it's the kind of thing where, you know, so I, if, if I, if, if you have my, if I have my phone, I can't, I can't turn it off because a hostile service is going to see it. Well, I can't leave it on and leave it in my apartment or residence because that hostile service is also monitoring what Twitter sites I go to. So then this is just conceptually, then I'd have to have my spouse or my kid be, you know, surfing, you know, Twitter and ESPN and all this stuff at, you know, that with the same pattern I do every single night, because you've got to, you got to be invisible and that just gets super hard. Yeah. And so it's the idea of kind of, you know, in pattern operations. And I think that's where um, there's a lot of thought going into, um, uh, but just, these are, these are just huge, huge challenges. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day. Is that, is that a, you probably can't say it. Yeah. we hope that that is being taught at the farm now right as part of that sure sure and and like and, on that it, yeah, it, and again there's a uts center so in this talk i gave the other day to dod what i challenged <laughs> to the dod community is does does SOF have have kind of a, a center doing this and if they do and i would imagine some of the special mission units are focused on this i think they are but are they i guess are they integrated with cia's uts center because you have to have this gold standard of tradecraft and so yeah. you know, that's the question, um, uh, I, you know, in, in the respective schoolhouses, is this being taught? Um, uh, I don't know. I would hope so. But it, sure. it is very interesting. And it, just a, an example of how we in the U.S. South don't yet think this way. And I think, you know, I, I've got a theory on it that's not that interesting. But um, uh, as an example, for instance, uh, just talking to uh, Israeli soldiers going into Gaza um, at least once with the two main divisions there. Um, and this guy was with the 98th, who's with their reconnaissance unit. But he said this was standard across. When they go into Gaza, even the conventional infantrymen, they put everything in a box, everything. You know, yeah. and this familiar to you, but it's not to the you know average Marine or soldier to include their cell phone. They won't yeah. see that cell phone until the end of the operation. There's no, hey, can I call my mom? Right. They're writing letters like World War II right. and, the, and the logistics officers picking them up, taking them back, scanning them into WhatsApp and sending them out. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so they, they are reverting, uh, you, you know, I mean, that kind of uh, approach is yet culturally not there within the U.S. military. Right. Within certain soft units, yes, but Main Street soft yeah, kind of the awareness, but not that you, you, conventional units. No, forget it. Can you imagine? 
Okay, right. hey, give, give me all your shit to include your cell phone. Two months. Send you send your wife one last text. <laughs> I mean, you remember, and you remember in Ukraine, you know, and and, th- and this was like, I mean, oh, this was some uh, some commercial firms were doing this because you know the, the Russian military had their cell phones on everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know, there's there's a, there's a hundred thousand Russian forces with with basically pinging their location. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is like this is a godsend. And so, yeah, you're right. It's very hard to for, to to stop what is kind of you know normal behavior. Um, and when the uh, and when the Russians, by the way, collected up all their cell phones, you know, and of course soldiers didn't get them back. Right. They there were two units that were exempt. One was um, the Wagner Group. Prigozhin never imposed that on his own guys. And the other group were the Chechens. You know, two of the. <laughs> Who, who were doing a lot of the serious fighting yeah. um, within the campaign. They all had their cell phones, and the Chechens were, uh, were incredibly undisciplined, unbelievable, experienced fighters taking selfies. I mean, it was it was a godsend to the Ukrainians, as you know. <laughs> That's why, yeah, but, I mean, maybe yeah, why I, the Chechens aren't. Yeah. You don't hear about them so much now. No, so, but, but again, you know, there, there's so many examples of these uh, of, of tradecraft errors and the need to be really disciplined. And so I guess the question is, can CIA and SOF, as we talk about this, you know, move to, to great power competition as a target, can they actually both adapt together to that ubiquitous technical surveillance environment? It's a it's a it's a, I mean, this is an awesome conversation. Like, I've, I've never had this before yeah. with anyone. So this is we're doing kind of like a graduate level seminar right now. For you know, you I'm know, like, one reason why I think the U.S. are. Uh, not just the military, but and within our culture, we find it harder to understand this. In places of Europe, it I mean, CCTV has been ubiquitous in Europe yes. for a long, long time. London, London right? was one of the so, first smart cities, yeah. right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so there is nothing, there is really very little you can do in public in Europe without yeah. it being recorded by a camera. And Europeans understand that, yeah. you know, even, and uh, it, but we in the United States, that would be kind of abhorrent to us. But mm. so if you grow up kind of being used to certain aspects of the surveillance state already sure. being in place, it right. doesn't make a big difference if someone says, oh, now they can listen to your phone or this or that. Uh, but for us, we hold on to this feeling of, well, there's part of me that's always exempt yeah. from this. Mm. No, 100 percent, 100 percent true. And and then, you you know, there's there. But it's also in other places. I mean, so certainly in, in Europe, you're right. London is, is one, of the, one of the one of the first smart cities. But do you remember that op? I think it was back in was it 2010 i can't remember in dubai when Mossad got caught trying to kill this hamas dude in, mm-hmm. in, in dubai Ooh, yeah there's the yeah, great yeah. there's the great uh Chris. cctv footage of an israeli uh, uh, intelligence officer and it was a, it was a female with a tennis racket yeah i thought that was hilarious <laughs> uh, and but that that was I actually know that, that. Been, that should have been a wake-up really? call yeah that should have been a wake-up call like holy shit in in the uae um Technology. Wait, where did they? That was on a hotel CCTV. Yeah, CCTV. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The yeah. Assad hit team with this woman with the tennis racket. Now a lot of was us. Was she gonna like Israelis, like serve him to dash? Him, I know. No, but so I, think, I think there was a lot of us who's actually served with the Israelis before. I think I recognized that officer. Uh, I think we I, I knew her, but but anyhow, so but that was a wake up call. But it was 2010. So yeah. you know if, you know again I don't I don't I'm not sure we have kind of evolved uh, uh, in a in a rapid fashion. Uh, but but our enemies have. And it's very interesting, even Hamas, who is not regarded, you know, previously not regarded as by the Israelis as being particularly sophisticated, showed a very sophisticated approach to taking out the surveillance, uh, all the surveillance assets yep. along the fence line, but also at the military bases that they then made a beeline for to kill the soldiers so they couldn't respond to the kibbutz massacres. Um, but that it was surveillance. It was those cameras. That, that was their primary target right off the bat. So you're right. And, you know, that's something that, you know, when and they knew where they were, they knew where all the cameras were. I mean, one of the first targets was an intelligence base, in essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Servers were located that, 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 you know, that did control the kind of the camera system. So you're, you're a thousand percent correct. And also, don't forget that Hamas, and and again, this is, this is hubris. It's what we did with, you know, in terms of Al Qaeda as well, uh, you know, pre 9 11 to some sense. Um, But, but there was this, uh, it, it turns out that, Hamas was very, you know, cognizant of Israeli SIGINT capabilities. Um, and so what did they do in the tunnel system? They ran this incredible network of, of in essence, landlines. So they communicated yeah. in ways in which Israeli SIGINT could not pick it up. Um, pretty extraordinary. And so, uh, and so, so that's, that's on, the idea of underestimating your adversary. Re- really interesting point on that, uh, Mark. So during 
during operations in Gaza subsequently. So jump forward from 7 October, at least five weeks, and 9-8 Brigade has done a relief in place with the 36 or whatever it was, a division, I'm sorry. Um, at that point, at the at the you know unit level they're still not getting intelligence the they, there is some exquisite there's a lot of exquisite signals intelligence allowing higher level targeting but for the troops on the ground they're gathering intelligence through drones it's all tactical intelligence um and and they're using drones you know obviously to great effect but it's kind of interesting so even now with all of those assets uh, tech assets focused on Hamas, the amount of information that they're getting is very limited yeah. because Hamas is adapted, right. you know, and, and no one gave them credit for adapting, just like no one gave the Russians credit for adapting in Ukraine. We, we, we have this feeling of, you know, Organization X is effing incompetent. We just can't yeah. take our eye off the ball. And as you know, the U.S. intelligence community trusted the Israelis to keep in their eye on Hamas, well, which was yeah. a big mistake. And yeah. now I'm gathering. I'm, I'm I'm guessing that the agency's doing a very quick catch up. We well, have that's a. Like, that's exactly. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Go, go ahead, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. We just speaking of what you were just saying, Andy. Uh, we and I say we collectively as a as a as agencies and as nations, we have a a mindset of they can't quote unquote they can't. Mm -hmm. We completely underestimate and just dismiss right off the bat the capabilities of certain um uh certain organizations you know like hamas and again that's going right back to the beginning of our conversation where human comes into play yeah. all this technology is great when it's you know it when it's it confirms our bias of they can't but until you have that person standing across from that other human being saying yeah well actually we can and we're going to you know and this is how until we get back to that we're, it's just going to keep happening over and over again. Yeah. Amen. No, 100%. You know, Tom Sylvester, who has now come out in public, uh, or it's been reported in public as the new deputy director of operations for, for CIA, he did, the, the CIA actually has their podcast, not as good as this one, of course, that we're talking on today, but it's called The Langley Files. And so what do they really uh, talk about, like, let's be honest. It's interesting, but but he actually came on and, you know, this was his kind of coming out. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's a great friend of mine, great American, and he, but he basically said exactly that, like, we still need a human source. So what is a human source? You know, it's not a snippet in time. It's someone you can talk to. It's someone you can debrief. It's someone you can task. Um, uh, and so so actually having that kind of that granularity is absolutely critical. And and one of the questions after October 7th that I had was, you know, what ha how did Israeli military intelligence, how did Shin Bet not recruit a single individual um, out of out of, uh, uh, in essence, a 3000 person terrorist army? I mean, that's incredible. You, you know, you, you know, there's I think there's a couple of reasons, Mark. One was the withdrawal from Gaza made it more difficult yeah, for right. human. And then when they built the wall, that gave them an excuse, you know, with all that, not yeah. excuse, but with that huge surveillance paraphernalia of, you know, two okay. billion shekels. It, it, you know, there is a scene back in 2021 that you can't replicate where the head of Shin Bet, head of Mossad, um, and Halevi, who's the chief of staff of the army, meet at this wall and and do an interview with Haaretz newspaper saying, hey, you know, this is this means the communities can sleep in. I mean, they were regretting that interview yeah. now. But yeah. to me, that was yeah. just, you know, it was it was underestimating Hamas, thinking that they were just caring about administering Gaza and now total reliance on a wall. How many lessons do we have to learn before we realize, you know? You know, I, I agree. I'm, I'm one of these kind of intel geeks that I actually am I'm looking forward to the after action. You know, the Israelis are gonna, they're doing two of them. One is the military is doing their own, which is a little sketchy in the sense of- Well, I, I, well Netanyahu I, directed the military one right. but to the, try and get the-, the... <laughs> Right, but, but when they- I gotta be careful a serious here. commission, you know, and it's for for all of us on this show right now. I mean, it's going to be super interesting. Um, I, I do think, you know, and, and to, to the credit of, uh, for example, Ronan Barr, the head of Shin Bet. I mean, he said, you know, this is this is on me. Um, I think you're going to see, every, you know, the, the Israeli military and intelligence uh, chiefs all resign after this, um, as they should. There has to be some kind of accountability. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be fascinating to see, you know, what SIGINT was produced. There's all these kind of reports that that the Hamas, you know, battle plan has been floating around for several years. Mm. Um, so, you know, how did that not get to the right policymakers? But also, I'm uh, in my 2000 and since 2008. Right. The, the plan they showed me up in um, uh, the IDF, they have a plan captured from Hamas. Yep. Uh, it was around two. It was after the war. 
it's after the 06 war That's and it shows yeah. it, it shows a five part encirclement hitting kibbutz that were taking out the military bases first so you could superimpose that plan down in gaza but Andy, and it is what they didn't have was a human source saying the plant it's, it's a go now exactly yeah. so, so to me yeah. that is that is going to be kind of the you know just as i kind of geek out on this stuff that's going to be the critical intel failure yeah. Um, uh, uh, but it's a 3000 person army, like how, and I, and I, you know, with all the counterintelligence practices, I still think it's a, it's a spectacular failure in our old kind of, uh, you know, human world. Um, uh, one, let me just, one thing, a pet peeve of mine, it just came across cause it was bugging me the other day. So the, the DNI put out their annual threat assessment and they still assess that Iran had no kind of knowledge of this, of this operation, which I just think is a load of crap. Yeah. Um, I think it was it's a, it's political because we don't want to deal with the Iran problem. But let me tell you the, why. The IDS say they hear Farsi, or at least the Israelis say. Yeah. You know I, mean, I mean, come you on. Know. So, so <laughs> in, because in Gaza. IR, who, who trains uh, who trains Hamas? That's the IRGC, right? So, and and you know, those of us in the intel world, um, when we do training missions, guess what we also do? We also recruit our host partners. That's that's fifty percent of my job. Sorry, it just is. It's true. not a secret. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you're telling me the IRGC. Quds Force, with their training mission for Hamas, whether it's inside Gaza, whether it's Iran, whether it's in Lebanon, you're telling me they didn't recruit anybody? Mm. You know, and so that's a load of crap. And so that kind of stuff drives me nuts, too. Yeah. Um, uh, now, you know, maybe maybe the Iranian intelligence services are having the same conversation we're having right now. Mm. Uh, oh, my God, we were surprised. But I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Agreed. I, it's it's interesting, though. Hey, so a couple of things. I. I, what I didn't realize is the the fact that Iran is the puppet master behind all of this is not commonly understood by the general public in the United States. And I, that was brought to my attention when someone sent me a note about one of our previous episodes, very kind. Uh, I forget what it was. I think it was a message on Facebook, very kind message saying, hey, that episode was total trash. All you guys did was uh, trot out conspiracy theories about yeah. Iran. Um <laughs> But uh, but but it is truly concerning. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, will will Israel be obliterated by Iran? No, very unlikely in the next decade or so or two decades. But that's not comforting. I'm not taking sides on this. I'm just saying from U.S. perspective, very concerning and how it was set up. The Israelis so focused on Hezbollah. The, the indications and I and you know there's a lot of discussion even the you know the um Shin Bet doesn't know the the level of coordination but what they think happened was the that has Hamas definitely expected uh Hezbollah to step in right. all the signal traffic was that Hezbollah was about to step in right after it kicked off they were ready they'd been preparing but for some reason they didn't where did that come from you know, no one, no one really knows. We can speculate, but the point is, this whole thing was was balanced and set up. Huge focus on Hezbollah. The you know IDF contingency plans are all about response to the northern border, oh, not yeah. the south. Perfect. You know, they had no off the shelf plans to pull off. You know, um, and so all of this was was uh, it wasn't accidental, right? Um, it wasn't a perfect storm. It was very carefully orchestrated. Yeah. Yeah, I think we take our uh, take our eyes off the ball or the balls that are in play. Uh, we we did it with GWAT. I think we and I saw it when I was at um, you know when I was at CIA. Uh, it was like I it went from when I first got there. I mean, it was well into you know GWAT. It was two thousand eight. So um, I noticed an uptick based on surges, things like that, of like guys walking around with beards as opposed to clean cut suits, you know, at headquarters, things like that. Um, you know, uh, if you, if you wear it, if you have a beard, you look exactly like an Afghan. Exactly. Yeah. No one can tell the difference. Yeah. So I think everybody wanted to get in on the game. That was the big game at the time. And so we kind of took our eyes and I'm, I'm saying this from my, you know, 10 foot level, you know, uh, inexperience there. Uh, it seemed like we took our eyes off of the traditional spying that I was trained in. Right. Um, but the point is, and going back to what you were just saying about, you know, um, how uh, Hezbollah was the focus, we can do it all. The Israelis can do it all. You can you can focus on Hezbollah 100%. because you have people trained to do that. Let them do that and say, keep your eyes north 
while we have those who are trained to, you know, to counter Hamas, let them focus it. If we need you up north or if you get indication that Hezbollah is going to step in, that's when you, you know, you let us know. But I think everybody wants to get in on the big game or whatever the issue is that's going on in the case of, let's just say, pre-9-11, um, the whole Cold War, quote unquote, spying was was starting to slow what had slowed down with what you know we believe was the fall of the the it was the fall of the soviet union but not the fall of russia um so now we were like okay now we can turn our attention to terrorism everybody turn and look this way but we didn't leave anybody in place to do the the traditional human and i think we need to get back to that i think we're getting back to that but what's the next thing that's going to happen that's going to take our eyes right back off of it again and i think that People like Mark, you know, who are, you know, screaming with what some people would say their hair on fire um, with the the whole soft integration. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that um, people like that need to keep keep screaming with their hair on fire, because if not, when that near peer thing kicks off, you know, let's go back to the 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 on the ground level. It's. It's going to suck to be that CIA officer, that that paramilitary officer or whoever who's standing next to that dev group guy um, or, you know, those those white side uh, soft operators having to huddle up and say, OK, listen, this is what an SDR is. This is what um, this is having to explain the no nomenclature and, you know, ready break and get them out on the streets to help. Like those examples you guys gave were awesome, but they were one offs. But if we if we formally train each other side by side, you don't have to. Everybody knows the the uh, the nomenclature. Everybody will know, hey, in this situation, you know, um, this is what we need to do because I went to the farm or I went to the Q course. You know, even though I'm CIA or soft, you can just huddle up and say, OK, this is the uh, this is the op. Let's get it. And everybody just goes and does their thing. It doesn't have to be on the fly. So I think people like you, Mark, and this is not me blowing smoke. Um, I think that you're what we need. People like that are what we need to keep screaming. Yo, great. This is great that this is what's happening over here. But can we focus over here as well? You know, so sorry. That was my rant. I, I think there, there are people thinking about this. Um, uh, you know, I, I am confident. Uh, uh, it's just it's going to take kind of the, the you know, breaking bad habits that are kind of formed again uh to get that notion of okay you know we can't wait for for the next conflict we do have to do that cross training i mean to me this it shouldn't be that you know the, the excuse the agency always gives is there's so few case officers mm -hmm. um there's you know and so you know it's it's it, the, the my other kind of rant and we can do it in another episode is about leadership training which we suck at we don't do leadership training yeah. you know to get to the senior intelligence service level you have to take basically three one-week classes in your mm -hmm. career Unlike in the military, Andy, that you know, where you're going to go for a year to a yeah. you know, staff college, you know, to make a colonel, don't you have to do two one year evolutions of training? No. Like that? And so Le we never did that because it's, we can't take people offline. And that's that's mm. bullshit. So I, you know, and I think it's also and, and the agency and that, uh, you know, may have changed, but certainly within the State Department, what it is, is just not an understanding of how leadership is really a hard skill. Right. I mean, it is it, it is. It's the fundamental building block without which you, you you really can't do anything else effectively. This is me spouting leadership propaganda because you know you, my 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 preferred brand is always toxic, but but you know it's you see this a lot, uh, especially in non DOD government agencies. Hell, you see it within DOD um, that it's all too easy to slip into a management style and justify it on the basis of the new generation. And forget about the tenets of what we've learned about, which are ultimately how you get people to do things regardless of the move on technology. That's one thing I've always was taught at the agency by a great mentor. Um, and I use it still today is there's a huge difference between a manager and a leader. And we have okay. too many managers and way not enough leaders. And it's it shows. Amen. Yeah, Mark, where can we find you? Tell us everything you're doing. Sure. So uh, you can see me on TV. I, I work for MSNBC now, so I'm kind of one of their their national security analysts. So I uh, I'll pop on and and uh, and try to give you know my apolitical perspective, which is very hard in these in these times, uh, particularly on stuff like you know Gaza uh, and uh, and Ukraine. Um, I am prolific, uh, uh, and I'm sad if anyone has to actually follows all my silliness. But on on Twitter, 
It's at M Polymer. And I will tweet about, you know, my favorite dive bar um, uh, in Northern Virginia, the Red Sox, my love of heavy metal, and of course, uh, kind of serious topics like national security and intelligence. And so, you know, I just, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, one, one cool thing I'm doing next fall um, is I'm going to be an adjunct professor at the Citadel awesome. uh, for intelligence. Excellent. Study. That's awesome. And that so, is you know, awesome. So people ask is, me, is this before they go on, before they go on to get their GEDs? Oh, uh, that's right. So no, I mean, I, I have, they, people have asked me why the Citadel. And I said, yeah. have you ever been to Charleston? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so I'm doing some stuff, um, uh, you know, here and there. It's been, uh, it, it's been fun. I'm trying to stay busy in retirement, but not too busy. Um, Cause I still, we have a, we have a house down the outer bank. So I spent a lot of time at the beach, which is, that's my happy place. So it is everyone's. Hey, uh, Mark, before we, before we sign off, first of all, I mean, we've got to secure an on air agreement to come back on again. Oh, sure. Um, okay. All right. We've captured that. And secondly, I want to point out that uh, this is, it's, it's kind of a, a riddle, but we've accomplished something here. There's only four of us. We have two Marines, two agency guys, and two Greeks. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, first yeah, time ever. Somebody's so bingo card got punched. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I All really right. hope that, you know, the Russians just tried to essentially kill the Greek prime minister the other day. I wanted to talk That's about it. that. Like, imagine uh, uh, what if... You the Greeks off. The Greeks now put together a nice uh, aid package. I think they're... Uh, they're sending all their entire inventory of howitzers to Ukrainians. So don't piss the, the, the lesson is don't piss off the Greeks. <laughs> yeah, we're not just sending Suvlakia over to fucking Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. It's not all about goats. All right. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey. All right. All right, Dave, on that note, why do you sign us out? All right. <laughs> check out a check out Andy on Substack on Twitter. Buy his book. Everything will be in, links will be in the description and the show notes for Andy and Mark. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you're listening to us on audio, rate and review at five stars. It's it's huge for us. And uh check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash the team house. All the links will be in the description. Thank you. It's only five bucks. You can join for as little as five bucks a year. Oh, no, five bucks a month. A so. month, a month. <laughs> a month. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hey, doing a GoFundMe. I'm Five doing a go a month. I'm doing a, a GoFundMe to uh, get you guys to bribe me to get back on Twitter. Oh yeah, of that it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.